Reading and writing text files, also often referred to as file I.O. for file input and output, is an important programming capability in most any scientific field, but it's certainly important for the data-rich field of GIS. There are many different formats of data. People make data entry mistakes. Devices sometimes use custom recording formats. And sometimes you may need to read data that is not tabular with your code. You may also want to write logs or reports with your code. Even tabular data may pose roadblocks for ArcPy data access cursors if the ArcGIS table requirements are not met. For example, the field names may contain spaces or the data may have metadata above the line that contains the fields, like in this image. You'll only have to learn a few new functions to start reading and writing data. Most of the challenge of file I.O. lies in processing the data that's read in or putting the data to be written into the desired format. For file I.O., you often need to use some built-in functions, some string list and file methods, and some operations. So it's worthwhile to review this terminology with some examples. Can you identify which of the items on the left are string methods, list methods, dictionary methods, built-in functions, string operations, or list operations? Take a moment to jot down your responses. Some of these will have more than one utility. It might be useful to look at some examples if you're stuck. These examples kind of give it away in some cases because they use variables like my string, my list. Split is a string method. Pop is a list method. Slicing refers to an operation that can be done on strings and lists. Join is a string method. And it takes one argument, a list. The list must contain only strings in it. Our strip is a string method that takes off the white space from the right side of a string. Int is a built-in function that can take a string that has numerical digits. Keys is a dictionary method. The first thing you have to do for file I.O. is open the file. There is a built-in Python function called open. It takes two required parameters, the name of the data to be opened and the mode in which it's to be opened. For example, the mode can be read or write. It also has an optional parameter called buffering, which we won't use that for when you're really trying to optimize a process and determine how much of the data will be buffered. Note that the name is the name of the data file. When you're using a built-in function, the built-in function does not pay any attention to the ArcPy environment variables, so the ArcPy workspace will not affect the name, meaning that if the file is not in the current working directory, the full file path name needs to be referenced. When you call the open function, the open function returns a file object. Depending on the mode that the file was opened with, the file object has various methods associated either with reading or writing. We'll get into those details in a moment, but first let's look at some code and just give you some examples to think about while you're learning the vocabulary. There's some lines of code in the notes page of the 
slides. I've tried out some of the lines of code over here. I first tried opening a file without using the full file path. I got an IO error and it said permission de denied. That is because I was trying to write to the current working directory and the current working directory is the place where PyScriptor is installed, with, to which I don't have write access with my Python code. I can check the current working directory with this command, and then I can change the current working directory with this command. So now, if I try to open a file again, it does not throw an error, and in fact, it's going to create a file. If the file doesn't exist, already it will create it in write mode if the file doesn't exist. So now I'm going to write something in the file and close the file. We opened it, we have to close it. Notice that close is not a built-in function, it's a method. Now we can look in the kittens directory and there's tiny file with uh, one line that we printed in it. Let's try create writing to another file. So there's no tiny file yet in the scratch directory. And so I'm going to create it with this write statement. I'm gonna write a sentence. and close the file. Now if I go to see just by scratch and find the file, which it should, it should already exist and it should say I love Python. And there's tiny file and it has what we printed in it. Now we can open a file that exists already for reading and we can read the lines of the file. Notice that read lines returns a list of lines. Here there's only one, but the list contains the one line as a string. We're doing this f close, f dot close, because otherwise the file will be locked and we won't be able to open it again. Let's try opening it for reading again and try a different reading technique. f dot read with a five in the parentheses tells it that it wants to read the next five characters. One, blank space, two, three, four, five. <laughs> five for the blank space where I forgot to count. We're closing the file again. We can open it again for reading. Just demonstrating the different ways that you can, can read a file. There are lots of different methods for doing that. Well, several different methods for doing that. We can read a line and then line will contain the string that is the, the, the next line in the file. Since there's only one line in this file, it's that line. We can close the file again. And even after we close the file, we have access to that line because the line is uh, in a variable that's stored in Python in memory. 
we say print line, it evaluates the string instead of showing the quotation marks around it. Now, we try to open a file for, for reading that doesn't exist. Say we spell it wrong and say tiny fly. We will get an IO error. Can't open a file that doesn't exist. Let's open the file that we do have. Read it again. What is f.read6 going to give you? Did you guess I love? Because it gives you one more character than the one that we used above. Now, if we say f.read, what do you think is going to happen? We're not specifying a number of characters, it means it takes the rest. So it had stopped at, uh, it was pointing at I at the end of love. And so the first character after that is space and Python. So f.read returns the rest of the file as a string. The entire rest of the file is a string. Not just the rest of the line. Now let's write a slightly longer file that has more lines in it. f.write requires a string. And we want to have multiple lines, so in this case we can write the carriage returns right inside of the string. Remember those escape sequences. And let's close the file. and take a look. Length on the first line and then a carriage return, height, carriage return, width, carriage return. If you look at this, the last line is the fourth line. Notice that I'm carefully closing the file before I go and try to open it up. That's because you've got to close it with the code in order for it to not, uh, to, to release the locks on the file. Now let's try another reading method. Since we have multiple lines, it's more interesting to say f.readLines. That returns the list, just like we returned, we got a list from that before with one string in it, the one line that we had. Now we have a list with three items in it since we have three lines. Let's open it for reading again. In PyScriptor, you just use arrow up. You don't have to use control arrow up. Let's say create a variable to store the return value of f.read. This reads the entire contents as a string. We'll close our file up and print content. And if we don't use the print command, if we just say content and echo that out, we'll see those carriage returns inside of there. Let's open our file for reading again. And now we can use the file object as an iterator. We'll 
What did we just do? We lived through the entire file with a for statement. Row was iteratively assigned the items in this list. And when they were printed, they get this extra space in here because of the carriage return. Because when you print, when you, when you say a print statement, it automatically puts its own carriage return at the end of each item it's printing. Uh, so that's what the, the extra carriage return comes in. And we have the, the automatically added one plus the one that is explicitly there in the in the string that we're printing. So carriage returns for this one, that gets us to the next line, and then it carriage returns again because of the print statement. So we've looked at read, read with a number in it, read line, it is, and read lines. Those are four different file object methods for reading when you open the file for reading. And then there's another approach which allows you to loop through the file. Let's close our file. And open it one more time and try to use a combination of these. So say we say f dot dot read line Can you predict what that first line is going to be? It's just going to be length carriage return. So that's the first line in the file. Then we can use the loop to pick up where we stopped. And what is this going to print? It should pr print height and width. Because at this point, the cursor has gone beyond the first row, and it's waiting to, to know what to do next. Oh, I'm using the word cursor because that's how you can think of the file object. It has a cursor associated with it, which points at the location in the file. Now, if we try to read any more, we get an empty string because we've already gotten to the end of the file. You can say f tell, and that says it's at position 23. The L it stands for long. That's a data type, but it's just an integer, type of integer. F dot seek allows you to go to whatever position you say. So now when I say F dot seek and then say F dot read 10, it gets me the first 10 characters because I've gone back to the beginning of the file. Now, if I say f dot read lines, it gets me the rest of the line that I stopped in the middle of and the last line as a list. Now, if I say f dot seek again, and I'm going to go back to position zero, and say f dot tell. It's at position zero. Then if I say f dot read, it gets me the whole thing. Let me seek back to zero again. Say f 
dot read line. That'll get me the first line. And move the cursor up to the end of the first line, the beginning of the next line. And then if I say f dot read at this point, it will read the rest of the contents of the file into a string. So notice the difference between read lines and read. Read lines returns a list of the remaining contents, the remaining lines, and read returns a string containing all of the rest of the contents of the file, all the rest of the lines. That open function that we were working with returns a file object. File is a built-in data type as opposed to having information stored temporarily in variables in Python. When you write to a file, it's a permanent repository for your data. Just like a book, when you want to use it, you have to open it and then you can read it or you can write into it. And when you are done, you should close the book so that you don't spill your coffee on it. So keep that in mind. Open, read or write, close like bookends on a bookshelf. We saw in our example that to open a file you use that built-in open function. There's no something something dot in front of it because it's a built-in function. And the built-in function returns a file object. Then to close a file you use a file method called close. So we were saying f dot close and then parentheses and that closes the file. Make sure to always close the file when you're done because you can have trouble like what's pictured here. If you try to open a file that is, that is being locked by your file object, it can say that it's in use with uh, another application and it won't let you to use the file. The open a file for writing, if it doesn't exist, it'll be created. If it already exists, it'll simply be whatever's in there will be wiped out and it will be written over. When you, you call that open method, you specify a mode on the second argument. And depending on the mode, the file object has either read or write methods associated with it. And then there are a few methods that are there for either one, such as the close method. Note that when you call these read or write methods, you're using the object.method format, like myfile.write. Myfile is the file object and write is the method. Here's a list of the modes. If you want to read the file, you should open it in read only. If you want to write to the file, you should open it in write only mode. If you want to append to the file, you can use an A, and that will open the file and start putting things at the very end of the file. R plus is a dangerous mode, and I don't recommend using it, but you can, with R plus, you can both read and write to a file. I say it's dangerous because it's very confusing to keep track of where you are in a file when you're both reading and writing a file. Now, up until now, we've been talking about ASCII text files. Like the files we've been looking at in Notepad, <clears throat> there are other, there's another format of files, which is called binary file. For example, a .shp is a binary file, and it can not be read with human reading <laughs> in Notepad because it's encoded differently than the ASCII text file. You have to use your special software like our catalog to look at the attribute table for a shape file because of this binary encoding. Now sometimes you'll want to write a file that is binary. For example, if you're scraping a zip file off of the internet 
that's a binary file and in order to write it to your local drive you'll need to use WB. Now we have an in-class exercise for exploring file objects. You watched the demo but it's very helpful also to try things out yourself. So try out the code that you see in the in-class exercise linked next to the file reading and writing entry on the schedule and then answer the questions that are at the end, the, the questions that are shown here. Pause the video now to try it out. When you're doing these in-class exercises that require copying and pasting one single line of code at a time into the interactive window, it's a good idea to split your screen like I showed in the demo and have the in-class exercise on the left side and the IDE on the right side so that you can go back and forth between them easily. Now we'll go over the answers to these questions that were posed during the interactive exercise. So if you haven't completed that yet, go ahead and pause the video. Why does f.write of 2 fail? The write method requires string input. 2 is an integer, not a string. If we wanted to write the number 2 into a file, we can do that, but we have to cast it to string first or put quotation marks around it. Why does f dot write my list fail? Well, my list, when you were working in the interactive session, was a list. Of course, the write method requires string input. So the argument that you pass into the write method has to be a string. Describe an easy way to write each item in my list on its own line in a file. You can do that by joining them together with a carriage return in between them. So we take the list and put slash in in between them by doing that quote slash in dot join my list. And that creates a string which will be separated by new lines. And then we can say f dot write of my string. What happens when you open an existing file in write mode and write things in it? Well, if it's an existing file and it has things in it, those things are overwritten. If you want to add to an existing file, you use the append mode instead. Explain why f.write a slash n, b, c, d, slash n, and so forth results in a multi-line file. Well, if you were looking at the questions before, you get the answer to this for free because the slash n is an escape sequence, which represents a new line or carriage return. So that brings it on to, to multiple lines. What is the difference between read line, or read to, and read lines? These are three retype methods that you get if you open the file in write mode. The read line gives you the next line. It reads one line, wherever the cursor stands, it'll read the rest of the current line or read the entire current line if it's the beginning of a line. Read two will read the two next characters, including blank spaces. If they're blank, they are also counting as characters. Read lines reads the rest of the lines in the file. What does seek zero do? It jumps file objects cursor back up to the beginning of the file. Give an example of when an IO error exception occurs. Well, in our demo, we saw an example where the working directory that we were trying to write to, we didn't have permissions to write into that. Another example could be if you try to open a file for reading that doesn't exist. This will give you an I.O. error. If you misspell the name of the file or you get the path wrong, it'll give you an I.O. error. Just to review, we went over this briefly in the demo. When you open a file 
In write mode, you create a file object that has write methods. For example, you can say out f.write and this will write a string. There won't be any carriage return behind it, so when we write the next thing, that will start immediately after the E. Aldef.write lines takes a list of strings as an argument. So this will add the items to the file. If you want to have them be on separate lines, you have to put that carriage return in there. That's that new line symbol, the slash in. You have to put that in there. So let's look at how this wrote. It started right after the E in stuff to write and wrote tra. Then it moved to a new line because we have that new line character. Then it wrote, uh, and we, it wrote a new, to the new line and then it had a space after that. So this is where this space comes from, the space after that new line. Then it wrote the LA and then carriage return brought us to the next line. Then it wrote TE. Since there's no carriage return after TE, it wrote DE right after that on the same line. When you open a file to write, of course, it has a close method. Notice that the close method has parentheses behind it. You've got to have those parentheses there or it's not a not going to call the close method. It won't throw an error, it will just return the function, the, the method object, and it won't do the closing that you want to do. I always have to use those parentheses. Then, if you've opened a file in read mode, you have this other set of methods. You can read, this will read the entire contents or the entire remaining contents of the file into a single string, including the carriage returns if there are any. Read 5 will read five, the five next characters. Read line will read the next line or the rest of the current line. Read lines will read all of the remaining lines. So if you call read lines, when you've just opened the file, it gets all the lines and it puts them in a list as a list of strings. And the list contains however many lines there are, it contains that many items in it. You can say seek five, and this will move it to position five in the file. Since it's zero based, this means it'll be ready to read the sixth character. Tell returns the current position. As a, as a number, and then of course the close method that you want to use so that you don't spill your copy on your book. Note that a file for reading only opens if it exists, otherwise an I.O. error is thrown, and we've just gone over the various read methods. The first three return a string and the last one returns a list of strings. There aren't any read methods that return numbers. So if you want to work with numbers, you're gonna to have to do some casting before you do any mathematical operations on them. When you open a file for writing and write things out in it like this, so say we do this, and then we open it for reading, we read all of the lines, and that gives us those three lines. Now, what happens if I say read line? Currently, my file object's cursor is at the end of the file. What's it going to do? Will it throw an error? No. It'll return an empty string. An empty string is false. This means that you can use this in a loop and when it, when it reads an empty string it will stop because that is evaluated as false. So you can think of the system as remembering where you stopped. If there's nothing more to read, the read line 
or whatever read method will return an empty string. Just to review, we said something about files with numbers already. Open a file for writing, say x equals 2, f dot write of x throws a type error. Argument 1 must be a string or read-only character buffer, not int. Obviously, x is an integer. Instead of just f dot write x, we say f dot write str of x that casts it to string and it's happy and we can close the file. Everything reads in as a string. So you must cast numbers to float or int after reading from a text file when using using them for numerical operations. F.readLine, that's getting the first line of the file that we just wrote. And if we try to use that number two, it's going to be in quotation marks, right? It quote two plus three and throw that type error. Cannot concatenate string and int objects. Instead, if we want to do that numerical operation on it, we can cast it to integer or float or complex and then add it to three. So bottom line, numbers go in and come back out as strings. So you have to cast them to write them and if you want to read them and use them for numerical operations, you have to cast them back to numbers. In the demo, we showed how to loop through a file while you're reading it. A file object is its own iterator. So you can do like the first set of code we have here, loop directly through the file object. I say in file equals open this data set for reading. Then we can simply say for, and we make up a variable name here, for line in in file. Then we can print it or we could do other things with it, but we're just printing it out then we close it up. So that'll loop through the file one line at a time. Or alternatively, if you have a reasonably sized file that you can store in memory, and if you perhaps want to loop through the file more than once, it would be more efficient to just read the file once, because seeking out to disk to read the file is more costly than using information that's in memory in one of the variables. So let's look at, look at how to do this. So you open your file, and then you can say in file.readlines. What does that return? A list of strings where each string is a line. You can store that in a variable, close the file, and then you can loop through the file, uh, loop through the file by looping through the list that you got. This would be your list of strings. So those, either of those will will print this because we've created that that length width height file the three day three D file over on the other page. Note that you can use a combination of looping through and reading. You could read a line before you do this one and then loop through the rest of the lines. That can be useful, say, if you want to do the same thing to all of the records, but you don't want to do that to the header line, the, the field line. You can read that field line, do something special with it, and then loop through the rest of the lines of the file this way. One of the common needs in file I.O. is to open a text file, modify the format, and write it to a new file with a, with a modified format. Here's an example from data that is directly downloaded from the International Panel on Climate Change. This is the format that the IPCC gives you, the top image, and the bottom image is the format that ArcGIS would accept, an Esri ASCII file format. It wouldn't take the IPCC format directly. Here we need to read some of this header information and change it into a different format and reorganize the way that the records are, that each of the records are. Once that's done, then our 
GIS can easily display the data. And it looks like this. This is the 30 year average January precipitation measured in half degrees latitude and longitude. We'll look at the general format for opening a text file, reading it, modifying it, and writing the modified version out to a different file. It's usually the way you want to do it. Instead of trying to modify the file on the fly in the same file, it's easier to just write out to a separate file. Doing the operation that we showed on the previous page takes a lot of string operations because when you read a file, everything comes in as a string. When you write a file, everything must be written as a string. You read a file, it can be a list of strings, so there are a lot of string and list operations involved. That's why we have this review of some of the string and list operations here. So can you match the methods A through F on the right side of this slide with the input and output that's shown in on the left side of the slide? So for example, quote six quote is the input and set six is the output. So which of these operations on or methods or functions on the right side would give you the for this input would give you this output. So go ahead and take a moment to write down your answers on a piece of paper. You may notice that more than one method or function may apply to some of these. That's your hint. Number one, to get the string six to an integer six, we can use casting, of course. And that would be part F. To take one item off of the list, we could either pop the, the last item off the list with just a pop with empty parentheses. That would, of course, return the number of the the item on the last item of the list, and number four, but it would also modify the list so that it would only have three items. Or we could slice it and take the square braces colon negative one, and that would get us everything but the last item of the list. Number three. We have white space on the right end of a string, then we can use R strip, take that off. Number four, if we want to take a tab separated string, then we can and and make it into a list, we can use split and split on slash T. Number five. In this one, the third item in the list is removed. We could do that using pop by specifying an index to pop off. So pop of two would remove the third item because it's zero based. That would return that item, but it would also modify the list. You could use slicing too, but you'd also have to use concatenation with it. A little more elegant in this case to use pop. To take a list of strings and join it into a single list, you can use the join method and join on a blank space. So it would be like quote blank unquote dot join and then the list inside of parentheses. Now you've seen how to open and close files. You've seen how to read and write files. Let's put it all together in a single script. Go to the schedule and click on the in-class page. And this exercise will be below the last one that you did. RDU Forest 1, part one, has you read this RDU Forest data set 
in and write it out to an output file in the scratch directory. Pause the video now to complete that one. Next we'll look at the solution. Line 3 and 4 are setting up our names of our files. Notice we're using full path file names. This could be a user input. We could be getting the path and concatenating it, but in a very simple example. So we're just hard coding those. Then we open the input file for reading. We open the output file for writing on lines six and seven. And then line nine is looping through the input file. Line 10 takes the output file and writes whatever line has just been read from the input file to the output file. Lines 12 and 13 close both of the file objects. So basically we've just done a copy, a file copy into a different file. We open both files for reading and writing. We loop through the input file and wrote to the output file, and then we close both files. Simple case, but usually we would want to do something a little more sophisticated, like modify the file that we're reading in. So if we had that problem where there was something wrong with the header, we needed to modify it. Then where would the modification step go? Instead of the line we have there, open, open, read, write, close, close, we'd have open, open, read, modify, write, close, close. So the general flow might look something like this. We set the input and output file names. If input file exists, we just put that check in there so we can avoid trying to read a file that doesn't exist. Open the input and output files. Then for each line in the input file, modify the line, write the modified line to the output file, and close the input and output files. This pseudocode can take you a long way through most of the file I.O. that you need to do can have this general format. The challenge can lie in modifying the line. The only difference you may see is that sometimes you need to do the modification to every line in the file, and sometimes you need to avoid doing the modification to the beginning of the file, for example, if you have a header line. And let's look at an example where, where that occurs. In this in-class exercise, we're using the same data. So you can start with the script that you just wrote. But there's a problem with the data. So the, the input file has a DBH of 14, 23, 17, and so forth. Suppose that there was a mistake made in the calculation, and we were supposed to take the square root of that number before entering it in the file. Somehow it got entered as the square of the, of the real value. So we need to take the file we have and modify it slightly. We want to modify that last column, the dbh column, take the square root of the value that is in there. As a small hint, there's a built-in math module that has a sqrt function and that can be used <clears throat> to take the square root of a number. For example, math.sqrt of 16 returns a value of 4. So let's think about the flow for this for a moment. We're still going to need to set the input and output file names, check if the input file exists, and then open both the input and output files for reading and writing. Then we want to take the square root of almost every row, but not the first row. So instead of 
starting looping through the file, we can read that first line. What we really want to do is just write it out exactly as it is. So do you remember a method for reading a single line? Do you want to do that first and then write the single line? Then you can start looping through the rest of the data and making a modification to that last column. Now, when you have the line and you want to make a modification to a single column, when you loop through it, you get that line as a single string. So how can you take that string and make it s separate it so that you can operate on the columns values separately? Well, we just looked at some similar examples. We had strings that we wanted to split up. In this case, the data is tab separated. So we can split the data on tab. This will return a list of the items in the row, say for example the first row, and then we want to operate on the last item in the list. We happen to know that that is the fourth item in the list, and so we can index into the list at that position and get the dbh. Now the, the dbh, first, uh, and when we're in the first row, we see the value there is 14, but remember the value will be a string because we've just read it from a file. So when we read that string, we'll, if we want to do the mathematical operation on it, we'll have to cast it. So we'll index, into the list to get that item, cast it, and then take the square root of that value. Once we have that, we need to, we're going to have to write the whole thing back out again. And to write it back out as a row, we need to put it all back together. So we have an operation for taking a list and joining that back into a single string, and that's the join method. So we can join the values of the list into a string on tab and make sure that we have that carriage return at the end of the line. Since we operated on the last item in the row, we've stripped that carriage return off of there. So we need to add the carriage return back on to the joined, joined string and then we can write it back out. So that procedure that I described that we do for line one would be inside of a loop. So we do that to every all the lines except for that header line which we've already written out and then we close it. So go ahead and try to write the code. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You may have to iteratively correct as you go through. Go ahead and write it, run it, look at your output and see if it kind of came out as you expected. Pause the video and next we will go over the solution setting the input and output file names, line seven, checking if the file exists, lines eight and nine, opening, creating those file objects, inf and outf. Lines 11 and 12, this is handling that header line that had plot, block, uh, dbf, and so forth. We've read that header line, written the header line. On line 14, we're gonna start looping through the rest of the file. Remember that the cursor will stop after that header line, so now we know we're at the beginning of the next line. We start the loop. So lines 16 through 18 are taking care of that 
they're, they're taking care of the operations we knew, need to do to modify the line. First, we're splitting that line up so we can get at that last column. We actually just split it on blank uh, space. By default, it splits it on blank space. We didn't explicitly split it on tab. And then on line 17, we are casting the value to float since we'd get, for example, quote 14, unquote. And then we take that numerical value and take the square root of that. Notice on line three, we're importing the built-in math module. So now we can say on line 18, math dot square root of dbh, and that returns the square root. Then we can go on with putting our line back together and writing it out. <clears throat> to the to the output file. So line 21 casts the dbh back to string and puts it back into the line. So now we have a line list that has our string square root as the last value. And then we join the list on line 22 and line 23 adds a carriage return and writes that modified line back out to the script. Lines 25 and 26 close the file. So open, open, read header, read header, read header, write header, read the rest of the lines and modify them and write them and then close and close. Here's another example of a type of modification you might need to do. So in the top image, we've got the original data set. And in the bottom image, we have the modified data set. Suppose you have some criteria on which you want to delete rows. Maybe there's data missing. Maybe there are invalid values in that row. In this example, we wanted to take out all of the rows that did not have a reporting unit ID of MDAIP. So they see that column, the, the third column there that starts with MACCP and so forth. These are fire ignitions that occurred in various parks and these are the reporting IDs for the parks. So how can you delete rows? We, unlike uh, the data access cursors, we don't have a delete method. But it's actually simpler than that. What we can do is use our same approach, almost, where we, what, what we were doing for modifying rows. Instead of modifying rows, we're just writing rows out, but we're only writing certain rows out. So we open both files, we read the input file, then we can check the row for whatever criteria we have. In this case, we wanna check the row if the reporting unit ID is MDAIP. Then, if it meets our criteria, we write it. So maybe write. <laughs> if the reporting ID is the one we're looking for, we write it. Otherwise, we don't write it. So it's deletion by omission. Then we do that through all of the rows. And once we're done, we close both of our files. So let's look at the code for this. So we want to write all the rows except the ones we want to delete. On lines three and four, we set the file name. Line five, we check if the input file exists. Line six and seven, open the input and output files. Line eight and nine are handling the field names, that first row, which has 
the list of the names of the fields. We read it and write it back out, just like the previous example. Then we can start looping through the rest of the file for line and in file on line 10. On line 11, we split the line. Notice that we're splitting the line on tab in this case. That's a very particular choice because in some of the fields there are embedded spaces. So for example, Northeast Region is the value for the region state name and that has a blank between Northeast and Region. So if we split on blank space, if we just put empty parentheses here and split on any kind of white space, then we would get this number as the first item, Northeast as the second item, Region as the third item, and MDAP as the fourth item. That would be okay if we knew for sure that every region state name had one blank in it, but we may not know that a priori. So safer to know that it's a tab delimited file and split on tab in this case. So that would mean once we split on tab, we would get this number as the first one, Northeast region as the second one, and, and the reporting unit as the third one. So the third one is the one that we want to check. That's why we had to split it up. So we're checking if the reporting unit is set is MDAIP. So we do that conditional statement and inside of the conditional statement, we write the line. That's the trick for deleting lines. By doing that, when we get to a line where this is not true, it simply won't write it out. So we don't have to do any fancy separation of the line aside from separating it so that we can check the condition. And then notice that we're writing the line variable, not the line list variable, the original line, we're writing that back out. And then we close both files. So this would loop through all of the lines and only write them if it meets our criteria. In other words, we're deleting those rows that have another reporting unit ID. This should be pretty straightforward because we've just done through some examples, but I want to review it one more time. If we have a line that has that is tab separated, my line, and we want to get write some code that gets the third value in the line. In our example, that third value would be SG. Write a line of code for that. And then do part two which is suppose you have this list and what would my list dot pop return? Let's see answer to that. And what does it what does it do? So to get the third value in my line, we can split the line and index into the line. The pop returns since it doesn't have an argument inside of the parentheses, it's not specifying an index for, it to, for which to pop off in the list. That means by default, it pops off the last one. So it would return to this guy. And what does it do? It modifies the list so that the item that's popped off is no longer on the list. So we'd have a list of 158. Now, this example is going to use the, the splitting and the popping. In this example, we wanted to do what's up in the upper right corner. We wanted to take that last column off of this file. So we're assuming that our, our fire data now only has the three columns, the fire ID, the region state name, and the reporting unit, and that we want to remove that last column so that it'll be fire ID and region state name. 
So the basic idea is to get every row and then modify each individual row by removing the last row entry and then write the row back out. So we set our file names, we open our input and output file. Notice we're doing a little bit of a different technique instead of the conditional. This, this one decided to use the try and accept where we catch the I.O. error in case the input file doesn't exist. So this would also not try to execute the rest of this if the input file didn't exist. So on line 7 we start looping through our rows. We split the line on tab and oh I should mention that Notice that we start the loop without doing anything special for the header. Why is that? Because in this case we want to do the exact same thing to every row, including the header. We want to take out that word reporting unit ID. So we want to do the, the last column removal for every row. So on line 9 we split the first row by on tab and again, we're using tab because of that white space issue. We use our pop method to pop that last value off of the list. And then we join the line list back together into a line. Concatenate that with the carriage return and we write it back out. So we do lines 8 through 15 inside the loop for every line and then we get down to line 17 is outside of the loop. So 17 and 18 we are closing up those files. One additional subtlety that I want to point out is that the reason on line 12 that we have to add that carriage return is because we have popped off the last the end of the the line. So this will have the the last entry on the line and a carriage return behind it, but we've popped that guy off. So if we forget to put this carriage return in, we'll find that everything is written on one line. So always check your file once you've written it. Open it up and see if it looks right. Now, we have some in-class exercises that are very similar to the examples that we just did, one for deleting rows and one for deleting a column. In the first example, delete rows, you're going to go ahead and try to write a script that will, so it's going to be very similar to RDU Forest 1. So you can start with that script and modify it. RDU Forest 1 was the one where you simply read every line and wrote every line. But in this case, instead of writing every line, we want to only write those lines where the species is set to LP. So you'll still want to have that header data in there. You want to keep those, those field names. You read and write that row, and then you'll start looping through and split the line up so on tab so that you can check if the species entry, which I think is the third column, is equal to LP. And if that's the case, you want to write it. You don't want to write any of the other lines. So your write statement should be inside of the conditional. You do that, loop through them, and close the files. In the part four, the delete a column part, you're asked to delete the plot column. So this will be similar to the last example we used, and you can use the pop method, but this time the pop method needs an argument in it because we're not popping off the last column. So the pop method can take an index, and that'll specify the column number that you, or the, the index in the list where you want to pop off the item. Now return the list without that item in it. 
So give those a try. Pause the video now. For part three, we deleted rows which didn't have the species ID of LP. So we set the file names, check if the file exists, open the files for reading and writing, and then handle the header line separately because we don't want to delete that. Then on line 12, we're looping through the rest of the data in the input file. Line 13, splitting on tab. Line 14, getting the third item because a species is the third column and checking if that is, comparing that to LP. If it's the one that we want, we write it. Otherwise, we don't do anything. We loop through the rest of the file doing that and then we close both files. In part four, we were deleting a column. So we start out the same way, setting those file names, checking if the input file exists, opening both files. And in this example, we've decided to demonstrate another way to loop through all the contents. Since we don't need to handle the header lines separately, we don't have any special lines of code for that because if we're deleting a column we also need to delete the header entry for that so here we line 10 reads all the lines into a list which we store in contents and then we loop through contents line 12 splits the line on tab and Here's a note to remind us of the columns that are in there, the block, plot, species, and dbh. That's the order that they're in. So that means that split line of one is the plot, and that's what we were tasked to delete. We wanted to delete the plot column. So in that case, we're going to do split line pop one to get to that second column. We pop that off and then our list just contains the block species and dbh information. Now we can join that line back from a from a from a list to a string and write that line back out again. Loop through, do that for every line and then we close the files. One last note, I wanted to point out that there is a structure called a with statement, which can be used for safe file IO. In this example called poemreader.py, we open a file for reading and read the entire contents into a string. That's what this read method does. And then we try to print the contents plus one. Of course, contents is a string and we're trying to add an integer to it, so that would throw a type error exception. Uh, we, we would then try to close the file, but uh, that wouldn't work out very well because we've already thrown an exception. It would never reach the file closing line. So this is the problem that we're dealing with. In case there's something going wrong when you're working with the file, it might not get closed. It might not reach that line unless you have error handling that carefully uh, closes the file in case of the uh, error happening. But then you have to check if the file is, is closed already before you close it. So another less complicated way to handle this is to use the with statement. So there's a with keyword and a as keyword and you make the statement like this. You put the open call right after the with and put the name that you want to call the file object after the as. So with open, the file name, the mode, as, f, colon, and then 
Just like after any colon, we have to have an indented statement. So the indented statements that we want to do here are read the file and do whatever we want to with the file contents. Now this with as, what it's going to do is it's going to ensure that the file gets closed. So you don't have to have an explicit close statement if you use the with as. And even when we reach this line, contents plus one, it's going to close that file for us so that because, because it's in a with as structure, it takes care of unlocking the file automatically. Right, so we went over a lot of subtleties and a lot of examples. The built-in open function is going to be used every time you open a file for reading or writing. We worked with file objects and noted that they have various methods depending on whether the file is open for reading or writing. The methods differ. There are reading and write mode settings and text and binary mode settings that you specify when you use that open method. The write, read, read lines, and read methods all have different return values that we went over. Remember the, the read and the read line, they both return strings, but the read reads the rest of the remaining file, read line reads the current, the next line or the rest of the, the remaining line. And then read lines returns a list of strings. And we saw that no matter what you're reading, you're reading a string. So you have to do special things if you want to work with numbers. We saw examples where we got, we through an IO error exception, that's if your file doesn't exist or you specify your file incorrectly, or if you try to write to a space where you don't have permissions. We talked about having to close files or use the with add statement so that you don't have file locking, and we showed a bunch of examples where we're reading files within for loops. The next topic we'll go over is ArcGIS script tools.